Hey guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 495, featuring an interview with one Steve Peterson. Uh, Steve's a great guy, as you'll uh, soon discover, with lots of great stories, a lot of great experiences. He's, he goes all the way back uh, to Electronic Arts' early days, and before that, uh, a lot of uh, experience at TSR, uh, Let's see what else is. Wizards of the Coast, uh, Capcom, <laughs> uh, and he's also done a lot of games writing, games journalism, and of course a lot of marketing uh, experience on top of all that. So he's very versatile and knows a lot about a lot. I think you guys are really going to enjoy this. So without further ado, here is Mr. Steve Peterson. All right. Hello, folks. I am here today with Mr. Steve Peterson. Is an award-winning game designer, an experienced marketer, as well as an experienced game and business journalist and analyst, an unusual combination. He's worked at a variety of game companies, including Electronic Arts, Capcom, Wizards of the Coast, Activision, GamesIndustry.biz, and a host of small game companies and developers. He's experienced with starting up companies, as well as running multi-million dollar marketing budgets. He's now the CEO of Story Force Entertainment. That's Story Force P H O R C E Entertainment. Massively personal story play. <laughs> That's an interesting concept. Uh, so maybe we could start there, Steve, uh, with this this project you've got going on now. Well, uh, it, it's kind of the culmination of uh, decades in the business where uh, I learned a lot of lessons about game design and marketing and most often the hard way, which is often how you learn lessons. Um, and uh, I, I wanted to bring this compelling tabletop role-playing experience to the widest possible audience. And I felt that there were a number of barriers to why tabletop role-playing hadn't become larger than it has now. Fortunately, in the last five or six years, we've seen a tremendous growth in tabletop role play. Mm -hmm. And I chalk a lot of that up to Critical Role and other uh, YouTube and, and streaming uh, people who have, who have demysticized role playing. And people watch it and go, that looks like fun. And then they go to a store and say, hey, uh, I saw this thing and it looked really cool. How do I do that at home? And, uh, and then, of course, everybody instantly becomes uh, a great GM like Matt Mercer. And that's, well, maybe not. But, um, but what they have done is shown that there is a hunger for that kind of experience. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, of course, role-playing was started with D&D &D and then uh, became huge in the 80s with a variety of computer games that brought some of role-playing to a very wide audience, okay? You ended up with Dungeon Crawls and Bard's Tale and a lot of other games um, that uh, Ultima series and other things that brought this notion of taking on a character and, and doing interesting things to a wide audience. It wasn't the same as what people were experiencing in tabletop. Sometimes it was close, but... Um, you know, the, what I found now is that there's this disconnect between uh, the way a lot of people enjoy tabletop games and uh, the way a lot of tabletop games try to get new players in. Uh, it's very daunting to have to spend 50 or $60 on a rule book and read 400 pages before you start playing. Okay. But the reality, the reality is you can start playing uh, just sit down and your friends will say, oh, okay, here, I'll, I'll guide you through it. You just roll a couple of dice and I'll tell you what's happening. And you'll pick it up. It's really easy it, because it is really easy. I mean, the essence of original D&D &D was uh, you had six stats, you, you rolled those stats, and then you picked one of a handful of character classes and that's all you needed, you know, and then you could start playing. You didn't need all this documentation. And now I'm not 
saying there's anything wrong with 400 page rule books, especially when your living depends on selling those. That's great. And people enjoy them. And people enjoy uh, looking up rules and getting into the details and, you know, but not everybody does. And I think the widest possible audience is people who, well, let me get to what's fun about this. I, you know, I'm not into reading big rule books or looking up rules or understanding that. I just, I want to have fun with my friends. And so that's what I'm trying to bring to a very wide audience. So. Yeah, I was looking at the site a while ago, and one of the questions on there is, is what if you could combine messaging and gaming to create yeah. massively personal story playing? So, yeah, that's a good question. I've been thinking that over <laughs> ever since. I'm, you know, that does seem to, what is your answer to that? Well, um, this stemmed from, I, I was having breakfast with, um, uh, the CEO of a, of a game company, mobile game company, and he was telling me that, uh, yeah, that, that um, messaging, social media and messaging are about 80% of mobile phone usage, you know, and I said, yeah, that's, that's pretty much true. And I said, but 80% of mobile phone, phone revenue, app revenue comes from games. And you know, I said, why is there this complete disconnect between what makes money and what people do with their phone? And I didn't tell him, but I thought to myself, you know, what if you could combine those things? And I mean, the essence of, of a tabletop role playing really is kind of is messaging, you know, but you're doing it directly often, or usually uh, with other people, you're it's a social thing. Well, why can't I have a host as my character? And in fact, now there are tools that I think make messaging a better role-playing tool than sitting around a table mm -hmm. in many ways. The fact that I could put a Snapchat filter in front of my face and be the wizard that I'm trying to pretend to be, you know, then you see me or you hear a different voice, you know, I, I've modified it and, and I can show you images and uh, it doesn't have to be all text. It can be audio, it can be video. And, and now, uh, unlike when we started role-playing, you didn't have references. I had to create all the images in your head with my words. But now if I need to, I can, oh, uh, let me Google ruined temple image and show you, okay, that's what the temple looks like, you know. And then I can riff off of that and all the players can go, oh yeah, that's, that's the ruined temple. And because there's uh, all these images available, all these sounds and, and uh, themes, and now it's relatively trivial to bring that out. But I don't think role-playing has really adapted to that. The, the pandemic forced a lot of people to role-play indirectly, couldn't get together uh, the way they used to. So, people were uh, forced into adopting online tools and found out, hey, yeah, I guess we could still play, you know, uh, it's, it's cool. And I, my feeling is that role-playing is fun, tabletop role-playing is fun, and you should be able to do it anywhere, anytime. I should be able to message you as the GM and say, hey, my character wants to go to that shop and ask about that sword, you know. And the advantage of that is I can do that during the week, wait for your reply whenever you're ready to give it, but it also doesn't take up time at our rare in-person session where everybody has experienced the, oh yeah, we got to spend an hour or two sitting around while you, the game master does some things with each player. <laughs> you know, I so know what you're talking about. Which is important. I mean, that's important stuff. And it's really cool for the player involved. For everybody else, it's like, yeah, well, you know, when can we get to what's yeah. what involves me? But what if all that stuff could be taken care of during the week? And so we're all ready to go now when we sit down either virtually or in reality. Uh, boom, you're in the adventure. You know, all the preliminary stuff's been taken care of. And we cut to the chase. Well, I'm it's, cool. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, one of the, the tools that I used to look at um, 
role-playing games, and particularly electronic role-playing games. And I said, you know, do a time analysis. What is it that people spend their time doing in the game? You know, uh, as a function of total player time, how much time do they spend walking? How much time do they spend fighting? How much time do they spend creating their character or fiddling with their inventory or selecting, you know? Mm -hmm. And ideally, I thought the amount of time and money you spend in development should correlate roughly to the amount of time people spend on something in the game. When it doesn't, there's a problem with your budget and your design in particular. I mean, the, the classic example of this is say World of Warcraft and they have spent countless hours and countless dollars creating a beautiful 3D environment that you walk through. And the first time you go through it and you're walking along, you go, wow, this is so cool. That's neat. Mm -hmm. And the second time you go, yeah, okay, that's, that's still kind of neat. And by the fifth time it's, can I teleport to where I want to go? <laughs> Do I really have to walk through this? And that's why you start flying or you, you, know, take over. Yeah. you know, but then you think, okay, so why did, why did I pay all these people for months of work for something that players ultimately end up skipping past, you know? And I mean, combat on the other hand, usually turns out to be remarkably efficient. Uh, your development budget usually is a very small part. You know, you create some combat algorithms. I mean, once we've got the animation and everything squared away, but people spend endless hours fighting, okay? Like in Diablo or something, you're spending all your time, click, 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 smack, 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 watching the animation, seeing the explosions. Yeah, spending a mouse, yeah. Yeah, but it's, um, it's really efficient in terms of development costs and budget, it's like, okay, that didn't take a lot of time. Maybe we had to spend some time tweaking it so it wasn't you know, completely unbalanced, but people spend a lot of time in that part of the game. So, you know, if I spend 10% of my budget, but they spend 30% of their time in it, that was really good. That was a good decision, as opposed to something I spent 50% of my budget on that you spend 5% of your time in. Yeah, that, you know, Maybe I should have found a different way to do that. Yeah, I thought you were going to use the, when you were saying the, the ultimate example, I figured you were going to talk about some of these uh, games with all the elaborate cinematics and cutscenes, and they'll bring in famous actors, you know, to do voices and things of that sort. And that, yeah, that's really over the, our Final Fantasy, you know. Oh my God, I cast this spell, and the first time I watch it, it's amazing. <laughs> I spent five minutes watching this dragon descend and, play, you know, and do all this stuff. And then, okay, let me just skip skip that skip skip you know so um i think what you're saying makes absolute sense you know i i, I could have dabbled with game development but just maybe i'm on the right track because i feel like i'm spending all of my time <laughs> you know dealing with like the combats and things that i expect but this will be the bulk of the game you know so i feel like this should be the most time spent yeah i mean and that's right i mean well if you it if may not be as sexy. <laughs> if you don't get that part right, then people won't stick around for the other stuff. Right? That's right. I've said this often about computer role playing games that I've I've played a lot of them. You know, and I always say if if it's fun to kill a rat in this game, it's going to be a good game, right? If they can make that fun, uh, if that part is dull or you want to skip it, or they give you you know I've seen even games that will have well you can just skip the combat. <laughs> <laughs> like you know hmm i don't know how this is going to turn out um, yeah when they when they give you the option to skip combat it's like, <laughs> it's like there must be a reason why they let you yeah, do yeah uh hmm but yeah, I was, it, yeah go well, ahead go ahead no no go ahead then. i was just thinking getting back to the, sort of the earlier thing you were talking about the i've, I've noticed that i kind of started playing i was in that ultima world of warcraft you know pretty much exclusively played the computer tabletop you know i'm trying to say, computer versions <laughs> of role playing yeah. games i hadn't done hardly any tabletop gaming and then maybe about a year before the pandemic i finally got into some groups and we were playing around the table and then of course the, the pandemic hit and everybody went to zoom or roll 20 or fantasy grounds you know that sort of thing but I thought this is really interesting. I was in two different groups and one of the groups, like they just couldn't wait to get back to the table. 
you know, it was like as soon as that was feasible, we, you know, we're meeting again. Whereas the other group was like, no, we really like the fantasy grounds. Yeah. You know, because all, all the stuff you were saying before, like we can we can have the we don't have to deal with maps. It's it's all digital. You know, we can bring in this, bring it, we could chat, <laughs> do all this other stuff. So I just thought that was pretty uh you know, I don't know quite what to make of this trend because you, you keep hearing, well, people are lonely. People want to have the social connection. Part of the appeal of tabletop gaming is physically there. But on the other hand, these tools make it its just so darn convenient. <laughs> well, you know, the hardest part, you, what's the, where, where's this going to take us, you know, now that we're kind of beyond this isolation phase, I guess. Well, people are so busy. It's it's always been hard. It just seems like it's harder than ever to get people physically together at the same space in the same time for a period of hours. It's somewhat easier if you just say eight o'clock Friday night, but you don't have to be there in person. You know, you can join us on Fantasy Grants. I think that ultimately most games will be hybrids of There'll be some players in person. There'll be some players remote, you know, uh, or every once in a while we all get together, but most of the time we're mostly remote or you, know, you got one friend over and we'll be together and then the rest of us will be remote. Uh, I think if we can make the tools work for that, uh, then you're meeting people with where they want to be. You're not forcing them. No, you got to do it this way. Uh, I think you you should give the if you want the most players you should give them the flexibility to play mm -hmm. the way they want and for that matter the style of gaming you know some people love the role playing part some people love the combat part some people uh, you know that there's all sorts of differences that's why there's different games and different settings and so forth some people love one or the other um, I mean there's there's campaigns that have gone on for decades in the same world with the same group and there's others that know some of those you know, the typical the typical tabletop game i think goes for like a year 18 months and then they you know we ended that campaign or we kind of got bored with it or you know we we all got so powerful it was no fun anymore or whatever and then you switch to something else you know we'll start up a new campaign or, we'll do a champions game this time <laughs> yeah it's um you know but i think it is imperative to try to meet people uh, and give them what they want, not, I think the fundamental mistake that I made and that every other game company has made, except for TSR, is that you try to create an audience. Okay, they play D&D, &D, most of them, but you know they're gonna like my game better. My game is better. And I will create an audience that plays this game instead of D&D. That's very difficult, you know, especially now when a lot of people have years of investment in D&D uh, mm -hmm. mentally. Uh, you know, I understand those D&D &D rules. I have D&D &D characters, you know, and now you're, you want me and all my friends to give that up and adopt some new game. That's very difficult. You know, that is, that is hard. So one of the things I'm trying to do with StoryForce is realizing that um, most tabletop games, especially if you look at in terms of market share, they're all on the same scale. They're all using polyhedral dice on the same numerical ranges. So their stats may differ, but they're all tend to be around the same range and, or you can easily convert to them. Granted something like powered by the apocalypse games are different, but that's, you know, they really don't care so much about the system. They're more storytelling oriented, you know, so the mechanics aren't really important to them. But I realized that if I can create tools and, and game systems that people can use as a standalone, but they can also add it to their D&D game and I can show people how to use that with D&D or with Pathfinder or with Numenera or with anything else, uh, you know, and, and I can easily adapt those things, uh, then they're more likely to adopt it. You know, who's, who's a reasonable market? If I can get people who play D&D &D to say, oh, that would be useful when I'm playing D&D, &D, mm -hmm. 
you know, I've got a lot bigger potential market than, hey, stop playing your D&D game, come and play this, you know. Uh, and so I want to bring the power of creation that we came up with in Champions to the widest possible audience and let you create whatever you want for your D&D game and make it easy to bring that over and, and do that stuff. Uh, so what StoryForce is all about is uh, both doing a tabletop and a mobile app. So I'm trying to bring both the tabletop tools and uh, mobile or web tools that will allow you to create uh, all sorts of things for your game, any, any technology or magic or you know, power level that you can imagine and show you how to do that in a balanced manner. And then let's, but also try, my initial audience is tabletop uh, because I know that audience and I know that they will get this stuff very quickly. But over time, I hope to appeal to people who don't, who are tabletop adjacent, let's say. They've played WoW, but they've never played a tabletop game. Or they, I sound like I might be tabletop adjacent. <laughs> you know, they're, oh, I'm sort of, yeah, I'm familiar like that, with that. I like that term, yeah. Um, you know, and uh, why is it that people still play tabletop games when there's all these incredible uh, electronic games, role-playing games, you know, with incredible visuals and, you know, uh, just all sorts of capabilities, but yet tabletop is more popular than ever. Well, it's it's giving people something that they can't get from playing any electronic game, which uh, for starters is the ability to influence the story and tell take the story in any direction you want. Um, and I know there's people who keep trying to tackle that and, and more power to them, but that's a really hard problem. You know, that's, that's on the cutting edge of AI and trying to create AI that could write stories and tell stories. Wow, that's really hard. I've had this argument with Chris Crawford before. It's like, you know, I, I told Chris, I said, you know, you're, what you're trying to do, this was years ago when he was working on his story telling engine. I said, Chris, you're, you're trying to create AI that will tell stories and, and replicate characters and deal with these things. But it's like making a movie, you know? Uh, you remember in Blazing Saddles when they rode down the street and it was all just the fronts of buildings, you know, because it looked like a Western town, but they didn't build the whole town. They just put up flats. Hmm. And, and I said, really, that's with a computer game. All you need to do is put up flats. You know, it looks like there's a whole town, a whole building and everything be, behind there. But unless people actually go in there, you don't need to fill that stuff in. And similarly with, with conversation, you don't need to, I, I, think, I think of conversation as one of the traditionally really inefficient parts of electronic game development. You pay writers uh, who work really hard and spend incredible amounts of time writing dialogue that players will skip through. Yep. And um, so I have a new way of doing conversation and I'm filing a provisional patent on it because I think I have something that's, that, you know, uh, is going to be really effective and it's an approach that nobody's used before. So, okay, well, you really piqued my curiosity because this is one of the things I talk about <laughs> all the time. Just, there's, I think there's so much room and need for innovation with the dialogue systems. You know, well, I mean, Warren Spector was talking at a conference a number of years ago, and he said he showed a couple of slides. He showed one. This is what role playing images looked like 20 years ago, and here's what they look like today. You know, 20 year old pixel, you know, very low res and everything. And now it was photorealist, beautiful portrait. And then here's what dialogue looked like 20, conversation looked like 20 years ago. And here's what it looks like today. And it was exactly the same. Pick one sentence out of the four, you know. And so this is, we need to do better. We're know? so good with like with the graphics that move so quickly and the, I guess, animation, the 3D stuff. But yeah, the just the, you know, I got some friends who are, 
I'm a university professor in an English department. And I have a lot of colleagues who are professional linguists. And, you know, of course, we're always talking about this kind of stuff. It's like, <laughs> but yeah, most of the, it seems like their consensus is, look, the natural language processing, the sort of AI that you're talking about, that could never be. It's just so they're very close. cynical. They're very like, this is just beyond, you know, it's, it's, I, I hate to, I hate to think that's the case. Cause I mean, where does that leave us? Well, it is just as close as self-driving cars, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. Any day now. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> exactly. Uh, but um, you know, it, it, again, I think people are focusing on the wrong thing. I think they're looking at the wrong part of it. And I mean, the, the essence of what we did in Champions, the great design innovation there, to my mind, what George came up with and I helped him refine and, and conceptually we, we you know, worked it out and said, look, what is important is the effect in the game. Mm -hmm. You know, what are the numbers? And rather than every other game generally starts with, oh, I have this spell that turns, you know, that, that creates a lightning bolt. And so it does this. And then you end up having to define, well, wait a minute, what if everything's wet? You know, am I going to get, if I'm standing in the water in this corridor and the lightning bolt hits, you know, does that, and you have to define all these peripheral things. And it's, is that diff damage different if I'm wearing metal armor or, you know, huh. uh, and Whereas what we said was, you do it the other way. You say, this is how many dice of damage it does. And that's how much it costs you. Now, what's the special effect? Oh, I'm gonna call it a lightning bolt, or I'm gonna call it a fireball, or I'm gonna call it a poison gas cloud, or uh, a spectral rider on a horse comes up and whacks you with a ghostly sword. It could all do the same amount of damage. Now, sometimes the special effects might have, make a difference in gameplay, in which case you can change the cost a little bit or add a little more description if you choose to, or you can just leave that up to the discretion of the game master. But if you focus on the effects first, and then, then you decide what the appearance and all is, that makes it a whole lot easier to balance everything. Um, and that led us, I mean, one of the more difficult problems we had to deal with and when we said, okay, we need to replicate every comic book power, okay, including anything that's super uh, effective or what if it, you know, transform you into a block of wood or, you know, how do you do that? How do you do something that sweeping? And we came up with, I said, well, ultimately we decided that there was an equivalence. If you could do enough damage to kill somebody instantly, then whatever amount of points that took, that was probably about enough. You could turn them into a frog or do whatever else you wanted to them because effectively the game effect is the same. I've taken you out of combat. Mm. You can no longer do combat. So the cost to turn someone into a frog assuming that frog can't fight uh, is approximately equal to the cost of turning it into a pile of ash or, you know, uh, putting a bolt of, of energy through your heart or whatever. So that gave us, that gave us a point to set. And then we could, you know, modify how things work from there. But again, if you think through it, it's again, looking at what is the effect in the game? It's not that I killed him. It's not that I turned him into a frog. It's not that I, you know, the effect is I took them out of combat completely. They can no longer do combat. So, uh, and <clears throat> I think that's a very powerful tool for developing games and balancing things. It always bugs me when I look at uh, computer games and I think one of the advantages that you have as a designer for a computer game is that everything's hidden. The players cannot see the numbers. You know, you can't see exactly how much damage these different weapons do or the chance to hit or any of that stuff, which is all out in the open in a tabletop game, which let me tell you, people have sent us printouts of spreadsheets showing that, you know, hey, 
Uh, <laughs> wow, really? <laughs> yeah. Um, that, you know, this is, this is unbalanced and here's why. Uh, and, they but with the computer game. They finally got into a fight with their friends. Yeah. The DM. But you, you, can, you can cheat horrendously in a video game or an electronic game. You can, you know, because the players will have no idea what's behind there. So I can call this a two-handed battle axe, but it maybe does less damage than a dagger, but you'll never know. Well, you will know eventually after you've used it for a while and gone, wow, this two-handed battle axe isn't doing shit. I'm going to switch back to something else, you know. Uh, and But all too often you see electronic games where pretty much everybody figures out after a while, oh, yeah, you, you want that that blaster rifle, you know, or you want the pistol or you want this, because that, that is way more effective, you know, in combat. And now, however, what's happened at Fortnite is a great example of it is they do what I call dynamic balancing. We'll just throw a bunch of stuff out there and we'll let the players figure out what is great and what is awful. And we'll tweak it next week. You know, Oh, that, that thing is dominating. So you had a week where you could use that and dominate, and now I'm going to nerf that. Oh yeah, oh, you know? that game. and and so that ha that is now kind of the standard way designers do things. Although I still say, why the hell don't you analyze that? You you don't have to have things that are outrageously better or worse. You just do a little statistical analysis, and you should know how to do that as a game designer. You know. <laughs> And you put the numbers up and, and look at it and say, oh, wow, this is doing five times the damage that is, you know, is there, is there some compensatory problem that, you know, why you should not use that five times the damage thing? Uh, you know, it's, it, but it seems like the standard now is just put it out there. We're, we're in a hurry, get it out there. The, the right. our 10 million beta testers will figure it out they'll let us know that character's overpowered. Okay, fine, we'll nerf him. You know. Let me ask you this, Steve. There's some computer role-playing games. I don't know what they call this. There's different names for it, but basically there's a combat log. or It'll actually tell you, like, it's just, I think the Pathfinder games do this, and they'll say, oh, look, you just rolled this. So even though it's all computerized, they're still simulating, like, the dice rolls and whether they saved or not, you know, all this kind of thing. Yeah. And you can go back. I don't know how many people. I, I love that. You know, I like to look at the log and see, you know, I'll scroll through it and see what's working. <laughs> Do you think that's a good idea? Or just, should they just not let the players see that? Well, um, <clears throat> I I don't know. I, I, a one part of me says combat logging like that is is pushing you out of immersion. Yeah. In the fantasy, and I really prefer you be immersed and feel like you're in the world. But if I'm paying attention to uh, the numbers, I'm not in the world, you know. But on the other hand, there are people who really enjoy that. Uh, yeah, see, I see. I probably enjoy <laughs> that more than the story or the, you know, whatever it's going. I don't know what's wrong with me. Maybe it's just I'm. But that's not, you know, <clears throat> the fact that you like something and I don't. That doesn't mean that you're right and I'm wrong or vice versa. It means we're different. Sure. You know, so my feeling is that it would be great if the game gave you the option. And what I want to have with my app for keeping track of things in the game is I want the interface to be adjustable to the user's desired degree of crunchiness, you know, so that I can just hey, I just want to attack, you know, and it'll pick the best thing and it'll do it. It'll give me the result and I won't have to worry about it. But I know there are people who, no, 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 let me go through all my strategic options and let me pick the 14 different, you know, I could do yeah, this. And that's that. <laughs> you, you know, and, and they're both enjoying it and that's great. And they should be able to play side by side and enjoy the game you know, by doing it the way they like it. That's what I want to see, not forcing everybody into, this is what it's going to tell you. And if you don't want that information, too bad. You know, or if that's not enough, too bad. This is what I decided to put down for you. 
I think that's the right balance. You know, one of the reasons I think World of Warcraft was such a was such a hit was that they had, you know, it's kind of like what we're talking about here. If you really wanted to delve in to the mechanics and just really get sort of obsessive about that, there were certain rewards. But you could also just sort of be a real casual player, and if you pick the right class, you know, it's basically they call them like the easy mode. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so you could be competitive and run instances and things even as a very casual player, but you know, if you pick one of these harder classes, you could do, you know, it wasn't <clears throat> huge. It wasn't like an order of magnitude difference, but you'd be able to be number one. Well, and there were, there were Art. groups that were oriented around role playing more than. Yeah, you know. sure. And, and on the other hand, if you're involved in a raid, you better freaking know your DPS <laughs> and be ready. You know, uh, yeah, the once you got into the raids, all, all was lost. I guess. That's a different, that's a different game. You know, the, the, Playing WoW to le- reach the maximum level is one game. And then there's a different game, which is raiding once you're max level. You know, and there are people who enjoy the climb but don't like the raiding, and there are people who don't like the climb. That's just taking me longer to get to the kind of guy. I love the climb and I hate the, the end game. Yeah. You know, I mean, what does that say about me? I don't know. I don't know. The the rating part to me never had any great appeal, but it's like because at that point it's like dueling spreadsheets. I might as well be playing Eve online, you know. Um, oh sorry, sorry, Eve fans didn't mean to <laughs> Yeah, we'll probably hear about that from a few. Role playing a spreadsheet, that's what we call it. Um, I play yeah, uh, Excel's the game. I, I'd probably play that. <laughs> but, Lotus one, two, three. Sounds yeah, good. It, it is. I mean, um, that's what's fun about uh, electronic games is there's so many different styles. And I mean, uh, there's From Software's deadly games, and some people just love those. And other people are like, no, I want to have more of a chance. I don't want to, you know, get ganked when I step around a corner. And, you know, I, I don't want to have to go through all that. Um, and one of the things I, you probably know, I wrote a book about computer role playing games or a couple, I guess. Uh, but one of the questions that comes up again and again, you know, we, you mentioned Ultima and some of these other games is okay, it's a computer game, so we don't have to be limited to what you could do on the tabletop. You know, we could have arcade elements, you know, like the Elder Scrolls series is a lot of that game where it does. It kind of comes through the Witcher series or some of the more extreme cases where, yeah, you really had to be <clears throat> dexterous with a controller, you know, just like you would with a with any kind of action game. Yeah. How to get through this, this sequence. It depends on the per- the player's skill, physical, you know, with these combos, whatever the case may be. Whereas there's another line of thought that says, well, this isn't you. This is supposed to be characters that you're playing. You know, all this stuff is just simulation. You're like the manager of a team. Yeah. Not, not the player on the field, you know, and it, it just kind of goes back and forth. And I don't, again, I don't know if it's a question of whether one's better than the other, or this is just different strokes for different folks. Well, you know, uh, every one of those games is abstracting to a greater or lesser degree. They are none, none of them are depending on your skill with a sword. <laughs> your personal skill with a sword. Well, not yet i don't know maybe they'll come out with an ar uh, sword. not even not even the ones in vr where you VR, are yeah. literally swinging your arm and uh b- because first of all developing skill with a sword takes a lot of time and effort and you have to be in good shape just to hold your arm out you know so, i uh, i realized that i got a sword yeah. Uh, not too long ago and the first thing i noticed you pick you, you pick it out and you you know you fling your arm out and you're like wow this is i'm my wrist is sore already yeah, <laughs> like how know, could anybody do this for like hours and hours yeah and and because they train for hours and hours and hours, <laughs> years you know yeah. um and uh Unfortunately, I've never been able to find a montage tool in real life, which would make so many things so much easier. But can I just do a five minute montage of building this thing so I didn't have to spend the hours doing it? No, you know, or <laughs> developing my sword skill, you know. Where's the montage tool? Crack up a little survivor music, and you know, by the end of the song, you'll be proficient. Exactly. I want a montage tool. That's the one tool I really want. Um, but 
Yeah, so no, no game is going to insist that you become expert with a sword, but they'd like you to think maybe that you're an expert with a sword. So the ones that require twitching and, you know, reflex uh, and combos, um, you know, they have, okay, if you hit in this area, we're going to call it this, you know, anything in this box is going to be considered this number and anything outside of that box will be this other number and you know, it's, it's all the algorithms underneath. Uh, and I guess the trick there is to make you feel like you really are using a sword. Part of the problem that VR games have is that your arms can get tired, you know? And I mean, it's one of the great things about a controller is I can rest it down here and I don't have to hold it up. I can, but you know, maybe after I'm playing for every hour, commercial you it. see, you know, every time Hollywood tries to depict gamers, what are they the hell have they never played a game before? <laughs> no, mostly they haven't. Um, you know, but the thing is it's it's uh you know, it gets tiring to hold your hands up and move your fingers and you know, so uh it is all about simulation and trying to figure out what it is exactly you're simulating and how well you can put that across again it's the end result that matters not how you get there you know uh and what is what is the player going to enjoy and how can i get them to enjoy more of that um, i forget who i was talking to about this but we were might have been monty we were talking about how the like the wii nintendo wii system came out and I, everybody loved the bowling and the you know, it just seemed like this was going to be a big thing. And then the next thing that came out didn't even have any. <laughs> was it the switch? You know, it's like totally switched back to the old style. Like, you know, what happened there? Was that just kind of this? Well, remember they did the Wii U in between. Yeah, the Wii U. Just, you know, mm-hmm. what happened? Was it, how did, why was that just a fad? I guess is the question. Well, um, I think what the Wii did, uh, was it brought in a lot, a much bigger audience. There were grandmas playing it, moms and dads playing bowling. Yeah, it, was, it was really great if you, you know. Yeah, you, because you, it was you simple. Grandpa could come and play with you. Well, it was simple, right? And then they went to, from the simplest video game controller pretty much ever done, to the most complex video game controller ever done, which was the Wii U. You know, you had a screen, you had buttons, you had, and, and plus they made the, huge marketing mistake of giving it a name similar to the Wii. So a lot of people didn't even realize it was a different console. Oh, is, is this just like a, an upgrade or something? Is it an add-on or, you know? Uh, and, and anybody who enjoyed the simplicity of the Wii looked at the Wii U and went, I don't know how to do this. This is, there's all these buttons. I forget it. I'm not even touching, it. you know? Uh, I think, and, when I think about you, I think about the report cards I used to get. I don't know if they still have that as a grade. <laughs> you remember that you get a U or an S, I think. No, that, that was the S satisfactory. The U yeah. was that's basically a nice way of saying you flunked, kid. <laughs> you were not paying attention. Yeah, you weren't paying attention. Um, but you know, I think that was the the switch got them back to more. Uh, of a simpler interface, you know, although I, I can't really use a switch because my hands are too big, you know, it's just those little tiny controllers are too painful. You know? Yeah. I don't quite, I never quite got it. I, I think I played the Zelda, whatever that Zelda game was for it. And I don't think I picked it up since I, <laughs> yeah, you know, maybe they should have stuck with the, the Wii, you know, just keep it simple, you know, why not? Well, um, Nintendo has always gone their own way. And, uh, you know, the, the difference between Nintendo and Sony is Nintendo is always focused on the Japanese market. And if the rest of the world wants to buy it, that's great. And if they don't, that's fine, too. You know, we're very old school, uh, very Japanese, uh, whereas Sony has always been more international hmm. and looking to we want to reach a worldwide audience with this, you know, and um, I think they've proven themselves with the PlayStation, uh, their ability to reach a huge audience. And I mean, Nintendo's profitable. They've done really well with the Wii 
uh, and then and now the switch um they've sold a lot of them and they're making good money on it but it is really not in the same market as a xbox or playstation because for the most part you can't play the same games you know and they have uh their own games and their own audiences and people get a different experience out of the switch i always felt like they you know you wonder if they didn't have mario and uh zelda you know these sort of big yeah. huge beloved franchises i think they would have been a footnote <laughs> well uh, they, just, they have those things you know and that's that's really cool for them yeah it's i just wonder when shigeru miyamoto retires yeah from, that'll be <laughs> what's what's gonna happen there I, mean, I, I don't know yeah he's great well we've kind of been warm we've kind of talked around this <clears throat> idea of the of businesses and trying to make a profit or just keeping the keeping the lights on frankly these days i mean we find i was reading one of your quotes this is from uh, venture beat and you were talking about how the big companies are going to slow hiring to be more focused on shorter term gains small developers will have to be more careful about their finances contracts are going to get yanked <laughs> basically you know not to exaggerate but things are getting going to get worse from here sounds like sure your thoughts on this and you know what would your advice be you know looking out over the next couple of i don't know what time frame you want to put here <laughs> you know let me just turn it over to you like what do you think is coming in the next few months or uh, six months to a year down the road and, and what, what should we do you know somebody is running a studio we're thinking about a, getting into the games industry just you know what what how can we prepare we don't want to get caught just by surprise well i think the the important thing I, i've judged a number of of uh app competitions you know of of kind of like speed dating for apps you know and i get two minutes to evaluate something and swipe on a 25 app. developers and they you know walk past and hear, show me your app tell me what you're doing and and uh you know, I would invariably ask them, what's your marketing plan? And, and almost invariably, um, well, uh, we're just focused on releasing the game right now, you know, and, and it's coming out next week. Or, well, you better not tell John Riccatello. I've, I've, <laughs> I've had, I've had uh, you know, PR people who I know in the business tell me that, yeah, I get calls all the time from developers who, hey, can you help me with the PR for this new game I'm doing? Sure. When's it coming out? Next month? No. I can't, you know, and um, well, why not? You know, because you should have started a long time ago. You know, the, the industry is very different now. Back 20 or 30 years, uh, there were not that many games coming out. And there were only a handful of good ones, really. And there would be months when there's nothing good new. You know, I'm waiting for X in a couple of months. And mm -hmm. um, and now we are in a marketplace where there are literally four or five thousand games being released every single day. How many did you say? Four to five thousand. Four to five thousand. Yeah, worldwide. Most of them on mobile. Yeah, I think that's the problem. <laughs> you know, and that is the difference now. Wow. You know, it the problem is not building a game, it's building an audience. And if you do not have a path to creating an audience for your game, uh, you might as well buy lottery tickets. You know, uh, maybe you'll get lucky and an audience will appear and somebody will put it viral on TikTok and, you know, a million people will jump all over it. But mostly, and those are the stories you hear about, you know, you read them. Yeah, I was just thinking watch. But the, for every one of those, there's a hundred or a thousand of I did this game and nobody cared and it just went bloop. Yeah, and, those those ones are probably what you. Those are the exceptions to the rule. And and it's not that these are bad games necessarily. Now, granted, of that four to five thousand, most of those are clones of something else, or you know, they are yeah, crappy. What, what percentage of those do you think are uh, good? Yeah, but but I will tell you that in 
any category you care to name of games, and you can narrow it pretty much as much as you like to very specific subgenres, there are more good games available than you could possibly play mm -hmm. right now. You know, if you if, if you wanted to, to pick a narrow subgenre and you looked over the past few years, oh, yeah, actually, there, I didn't know there were that many. There's a whole bunch I haven't played, you know. I haven't even seen. I didn't even know about this until I started looking, you know. So you can have a big stack of these are cool games that I'd really like to play. And I haven't even gotten to them, you know, because I, I got all this other stuff. So that... Uh, what I tell developers is I said, look, would you create your game, build your code and get everything ready? And then a week before you release go, oh yeah, I need some artwork and contact an artist. No, you wouldn't. You would have, no, no, I would have gotten the artist at the very beginning, right? And, you know, I, I might use some placeholder stuff, you know, along the way, but when the, when I got art, an animation, I would plug it in and, you know, maybe it get refined more and there'd be this process, but same with music and sound effects and so forth. When you start your development cycle, you would plan for all that, right? You would say, okay, I need some preliminary art here. I need better quality art here. And I need final art by this time. And I need, you know, animations on this schedule and so forth. You would, you would know when these different pieces are coming. And I tell them, you've got to think of marketing the same way. You know, you've got to plan from the inception of your project. What, uh, and the, the question you have to ask yourself is, what audience am I going after with this game? How are they going to find out about it, uh, first of all? And what's going to compel them to then, once they've heard about it, to seek it out? and then to download it, and then to spend some time with it, you know, even 20 seconds, a minute, you know, do you really have, even have that long? And then once they've actually spent a little time, what's to keep them playing? And then after that, what's to get them to spend some money in it? You know, well, maybe, oh, it's a $60 game, they'll have to spend the money up front. Well, then your challenge is even bigger. You know, because you're going to have to convince somebody to spend yeah, a big pile. 60 bucks on a unknown yeah. game. No, I mean, you'll do that for the next Call of Duty right. because you you have a reasonable expectation that I'm going to get my money's worth. And the problem is I can't return it. So I, you know, when I spend that $60, I better freaking well get, I'm going to get my $60 worth out of this. You know. And uh, thing, my, my, my challenge with this is you know, I've been, I've been working on it for a couple of years, this little indie project of mine, but I'm not 100% sure, to be honest, <laughs> I'll ever be able to finish this thing and, and get it up. You know, so I'm always asking myself, do I even want to tell people what I'm working on? Do I want to be getting hopes up or, you know, I don't know if it's what it's going to look like six months from now. You know, that there's is, just so many unknowns, including I don't know if I'll be able to do this. That is a difficult question. You do have to, you have to portion out the information, you know, and, and say what you want to say at what time and be careful about what you promise. You know, yeah, I've and, seen a lot of people get burned, you know, fans as well as developers by sort of promising, you know, what's the example? From the first under promise, <laughs> under promise and over deliver, right? You know, that's the basics. Um, but the thing that, I tell developers you should do is you, you developers, the one thing they have in common is they're creative. You know, some may be more creative than others, but they like being creative and they like creating things. Okay, you need to use that creativity on your marketing and PR. Okay. You, you need to spend some time thinking about your project from that angle and, and from a user perspective. I, I set my design aside for a while and I said, okay, I'm going to work on the product marketing plan. And, you know, I'm going to shift my brain to marketing mode and, okay, what are the key features of this product? What, what are the compelling selling points of this that make it different than other things? Why do I want to play this or to acquire this game? 
And as I thought about it, I thought, you know, the features I had, well, there's, no, there's things that it should do that it doesn't. Okay, I just created a new feature that now is important because that will become a key selling point. If it could it's do that. Feed into each other. It's almost like a, a loop. Exactly. If, oh, if that was in there, boy, I'd really want that. I want a game that could do that, you know? And then you think, why wasn't I putting that in from the start? Well, because I was lost in the creative fog of, you know, doing it and, and but do not turning a character into wood versus <laughs> right, but not but not worrying about you know the audience. I mean, the lesson I learned with a game called Justice Incorporated is it, it you know it turned out there were like five thousand people that absolutely loved this game, you know, and bought it off the shelves and uh, you know praised it to the heavens. You know, uh, still to this day, a, a lot of people who are familiar with it will say that's you know, one of my favorite games. This did a great job. I loved it. Uh, and so we printed up another 5,000 and they just sat there in the warehouse. You know, we sold a few of them and we gradually got rid of most of them, but it took us years. It turned out there were 5,000 people who thought that was great, but there weren't 10,000 people, hmm. you know, and there weren't 20,000 and there weren't 100,000. And, you know, the, the thing that that taught me is do not confuse what you love with what a sizable audience loves, you know? And if you're in the business to do things that you love because you're independently wealthy or whatever, that's great, you know, nothing wrong with that. If you're trying to pay the bills, you better spend some time thinking about what an audience is going to like. And is there a sufficient audience to pay the bills that I'm going to incur creating this thing? And how do I reach them? How do I, you know, do I, I create a demographic? What are these people like? What do they do? What do they have in common? What things do they read? What sites do they go to? What social media do they live on? What do they look for? How do I appeal to them? You know, what features will I have that will, you know, get them, even if they just heard a rumor of it, oh, I want to, I want to find that thing that does that, you know? And, and really try to get some numbers that will tell you how many of those people are there, you know? And is that number big enough to pay for your development costs? You know, do that kind of analysis. And I think, I think a lot of games wouldn't get started. I mean, just because you thought of a game idea, it may be cool, it may be fun, but it may not be profitable, you know? And if you want to do something that's profitable, then you have to evaluate it with a whole different set of criteria. As you mentioned, you've done some of these app speed dating <laughs> competitions. I was curious, like, were there any that you're like, whoa, that's a really solid PR and marketing plan? Not a one. <laughs> Not, Not a, a single one. Uh, yeah, what, well, what, what, what would have impressed you? I guess we could. What way. would have impressed me is somebody who had a grasp of how they were going to appeal to their audience, why this match three game was going to stand out from all the other match three games or, you know, uh, I mean, got one, I remember one developer, he didn't even know how he was going to generate money. Well, we're not sure if we're going to make it a paid app or free to play with, you know, virtual goods. And, and you told me you're a week away from publishing it and you <laughs> haven't even figured out how you're going to get people to, give you money for it i mean seriously it you know would impress me to know how you uh have evaluated that audience and why you think you can reach that audience you know well what method do you do well i'll put out i'll put out a youtube oh like the other bazillion youtube videos that come out every day how will anybody watch yours well i'm going to talk to matt he's got twenty thousand followers okay that that's a data that's, point that's brilliant <laughs> okay that's a that's a good start you know do you know other youtubers who have audiences that will talk about your product well let me let me see you know start to make a list uh you know figure that out if you you know the the games there are a number of mobile game companies like zynga is a good example right they have millions of 
players. So when they introduce a new title, they automatically know I've got millions of people I can show this to. You know, so I have a head start as opposed to I'm a small indie developer that nobody's ever heard of and I don't have any past record. I don't have an audience I've built up. I got nothing starting from zero. It's being like being saying, I'm going to be a huge social influencer. Right now I have zero followers. <laughs> okay, you got a big hill to climb, this buddy. Viral video. You yeah, know, sure. uh, you know, maybe you've got a clever thing or you're incredibly attractive or you're, you know, a brilliant speaker or whatever, you know, but demonstrate. Or none, none of the above. <laughs> or none of the above. I just, I'm figuring I'll get lucky. Okay, good luck. You know, good luck. Um you know, so you've got to, I think, uh, if you have built up an audience, or if you're a developer, uh, start building an audience even before you've got your thing going. I mean, you're working on a game. I don't need to know anything about it. But I do know that you have 20,000 plus followers through your YouTube channel. So when you want to start talking about it, you're going to have a head start over me if I don't have any followers, you know, Oh, Matt's way ahead of me. You know, I mean, you're you're going to have at least twenty thousand people that you can tell this to that will listen, right? Well, you, now, in your case, you could be like, "Look at what my look at what I've done in the past." You know, I got this. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I, I've Early, got, uh, I, I'm not counting on you know a huge amount of those. Although I do encounter champions fans everywhere, but um, you have to look at all the ways you can gather audiences. Mm -hmm. you have friends, you know, you have acquaintances. Um, sometimes a celebrity will get onto something. Uh, sometimes you, you know what, I want to help this particular charity. So I'm going to make a connection. I'm going to donate for every copy I sell. And there's a natural connection with the setting of this game and this charity. I mean, this game is about wildlife and I want to help the wildlife federation or, you know, oh. uh, you know, you look for things you can do to connect to audiences, you know, or, I mean, uh, you know, you, I'm doing a golf game. Okay, well, obviously, the golfers have lots of, of, there's magazines, there's TV channels, there's YouTubes, there's, you know, there's all sorts of things. And, and they have different aspects of golf that they're interested in. What's unusual about my game? How does that you know, clue into this particular type of golf user, you know, and there's, unfortunately, there's no one size fits all answer for games. And that's good, because when there is, everybody jumps onto it, right? Um, when mobile apps were getting started, the, it gradually became clear to people that, well, if I can, if I could appear on the charts in iOS, you know, if I can, somehow get into that top 10 list initially, then boy, howdy, that'll raise my uptake and I can, you know, stay on there for a while. So people started spending a lot of money early on just to get up on that chart, you know, and, and a lot of user acquisition dollars. There's still a lot of user acquisition dollars being spent, but for my money, I wouldn't spend any of that unless you have an organic market that you can count on that you're building from word of mouth and from social media and other things once you feel like you have a story i've got some evidence that shows me that I can sell then start testing some you know some advertising and some search engine stuff and other things but um you know just to say okay i'm going to dump a quarter million dollars into uh you know into Facebook ads, okay, you know, uh, maybe that'll work, maybe not, I don't know, you know, but I would not start with a huge ad buy unless you've got tons of money. Yeah, I've always gone back and forth with this, not just with this game project, but with the uh, this YouTube channel, you know, thinking about, you know, everybody, I, every now and then I'll get a comment, like, you should have, you know, X number more subscribers, you know, that, that's, why don't you do this, why don't you, I don't think anybody's ever proposed Facebook ads. <laughs> well, no, you, you think, yeah, some people, uh, you know, I've, when I first, was first starting, I'd always get these comments from other YouTubers. They're like, look, if you come and subscribe to my 
channel. I'll subscribe to yours. And then, you know, it's almost like a, uh, what do you want to call that? A pyramid. <laughs> <laughs> That's the play word. Yeah. I, don't, I just don't know. I mean, what are, you know, there is an element of, of chance. I mean, um, great example is the guy who was uh, chugging a, uh, I forget what he was chugging even, but he was on a skateboard and he was, you know, doing a selfie and chugging that and, and uh, it, it just went viral, you know, as he's, as he's going back and forth on the skateboard. And, and I mean, to the point where I think he was hanging onto the back of a truck, you know, and being pulled along and just enjoying life. And, and the, 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 I think the company that did the drink bought him a truck and, you know, because he, wow. he had so many millions of views. Uh, it, it's, uh, if I just you get know, a board and yeah, you can't plan that. Right. You know, it's just like, it just happened, you know, and that was not, I mean, I don't know. He's probably a YouTuber now and, and an influencer. I don't know. Or maybe he just sank and disappeared. So many of the early YouTube hits were just one shots, you know, the kid who just came back from the dentist or something, you know, it's not like he has a YouTube channel, but then there's other kids that I just really enjoy opening things. And, you know, now I have millions and millions of followers. And I, millions. I just can't believe it. <laughs> you know, who would have said, you know, and just this particular kid is very attractive. You know, he just, there's a way about that kid that makes you want to watch. Um, and so many influencers that there's just something about their voice, their appearance, their mannerisms, whatever that, that get people hooked, you know, or what it may be. Sometimes it's what they're talking about. Uh, wow. They always have great insights or, you know, uh, what's that and, charisma score? Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, there's, uh, but that's, I mean, that to to circle back to something i mean that is part of the game that i am creating is i'm trying to deal more with uh since i wanted to have a social media within the game and to influence within the game and to deal with reputation and influence and uh social media as you as you were in a fantasy setting, for instance, or any setting, your character probably has a reputation over time. If they've done things, people will sing about it or people will scream about it or, you know, um, depending on what you've done, maybe they, people love you in this area or maybe they hate you or, you know, uh, and not all characters. There's a lot of characters who are like, hey, I don't want to make waves. I don't want anybody to know about you know, what I've done, or I'm not talking about this, but other characters will, there'll be a bard following them, brave Sir Robin, you know, and they're singing their song. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, uh, and, uh, you know, I think that would be kind of a fun element to add to the game. And it, and it can be, it's another tool that a game master can use to integrate the players into the story. You know, it's, uh, oh, Oh, they've heard about you, <laughs> you know. Oh my God, that's him. That's him. He's here. He's in our town, you know. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's. Um, I th I think what a game system should do is give the players and the and the game master, the story master, whatever you want to call them, tools and hooks to help them generate more interesting outcomes and you don't have to use all of them you don't have to use any of them you know come up with your own um I, I mean i'm developing a setting at the same time as i'm doing the rules because i'm i'm planning to do a kickstarter to introduce the rules and then eventually uh, the setting and other books because kickstarter is a great marketing tool and if i can't convince a few thousand people that what I'm doing is interesting, then, you know, maybe I shouldn't be raising the money to do an app, um, you know, but it's a great inexpensive way. It takes, takes a lot of effort, but it will help me validate my market opportunity, right? If I can do a Kickstarter 
and successfully get a few thousand people interested in it, invested in it, that tells me that, okay, there's, there's a market. People are interested in this content. I guess that confused me about Kickstarter. I've heard people say that before, that it's a great marketing tool. But I always wonder, like, well, how do you get the marketing for the marketing tool? <laughs> well, there are... Um, you know what I mean? I mean, like... <laughs> It well, again, you have to you have to have an audience, right? And uh, you don't launch a Kickstarter without doing a lot of prep work and without talking about it for a while ahead of time and trying to get people already interested through your website, through your videos, through your social media. Hey, I've got a Kickstarter coming up. Please sign up for it early. Because if I can make it successful on that first day, Kickstarter will help me market it right um and so i want to get the message out to as wide an audience as i can oh yeah kickstarter is coming next month and you know here look for it here and get people signed up on a mailing list and i will send you emails when it's getting ready um and you know that you can take as long as you need to in that process you know and okay now i've got 3,000 people on my mailing list, I think that's good enough. You know, I can get, or maybe you think, no, that's not good enough. I want 5,000, you know, or looking at your trend lines or whatever. Um, yeah, this is got, like me. I feel like this is just so important what we're talking about here because, you know, I've talked to a lot of those folks that have done Kickstarters and the ones where they talk about there's a window where if you don't make your goal within it's really short like within the first couple of days i mean if you don't make it by that point it's probably it's like yeah. it's it's, you're, it's toast right you, you're not going to make yeah. it up on the back end <laughs> yeah i mean if you're not a, at like 70 or 80 percent in the first day or or two yeah you know unless you do something extraordinary in the course of it i mean you should have a campaign plotted out of not only how can i make this successful the first day but then how can I keep the interest going and get people to go further and meet stretch goals? And, you know, uh, how can I appeal to a wider audience um, now that the Kickstarter is actually running and try to get that big boffo finish that you'd really like, you know? Uh, and I know obviously a lot of people who have done Kickstarters and it is not easy. Uh, it requires a lot of work. And now more than ever, it's gotten yeah, I've heard harder. plenty. I've heard people say it was harder to do the Kickstarter campaign than it was to make the game. Yeah. Yeah. And um, especially for first time Kickstarters, you need to, you know, the, one of the questions people ask, why should I trust that you're going to do this? You know, uh, that you're actually going to, now it's really difficult with hardware, but I think that's why tabletop products tend to do better on Kickstarter than, than electronic products. Because electronic products, there's a long time. If I tell you I'm going to do an electronic game, uh, that could be a, a year or two, or three, you know, and you want how much money? Um, versus at least with tabletop games, you can, I have a first draft. And so I, you know, I'm confident now that I have a first draft that when this Kickstarter finishes, I can get it to the printer, you know, within a month or two. And then, it'd be, you know, so six months from now, you'll see it. Um, and the amount of art that goes in depends on how much you guys back it or, you know, so there are variables there, but, uh, if you want to be reassuring to people, you show them how far along things are, you know, not, I've got this idea. I haven't written any of it yet. And you know, yeah, you know, yeah, remember sure. exploding, exploding kittens. Yeah. Yeah. That was the one that I thought was pretty clever. Got that the, was very clever. You know, but Matthew Inman had a huge following before he did that, right? So everybody who loved his cartoons jumped on that with both feet. And of course, it was a, a funny concept and, you know, yeah. it was amusing. And, he, you know, so he used his advantages to the fullest. And, um, you know, so it's it's certainly possible, but I don't think you should minimize the amount of effort required. And it does, again, require creativity in other areas, you know, using the creativity that
that you put into the game into the marketing and the media relations and all the other stuff. Um, yeah, and, that's a good, I mean, if it's a good point, if you, I mean, if you're saying this game is going to be fun and I know that cause I understand fun, but my Kickstarter campaign is, is really boring. <laughs> it's not yeah. like, you know, you kind of have to show through the Kickstarter that you, you if you can make that fun, you know, yeah. there, there seems to be more hope. <laughs> that the product is going to be fun as well. Well, if you watch a lot of Kickstarter videos, you'll see there's a huge range of, of uh, how they do them. And, and some are pretty serious and some are really silly and, you know, some are informative, some are not so much, you know, and it depends on the nature of the product that I'm looking at that, you know, if, if you're trying to do a really silly video for a hardware product, I'm like, yeah, I, uh, okay, that was funny, but I, it doesn't reassure me as to the quality of your hardware product. You know, it's really, there's a cognitive dissonance there. Um, and, uh, you know, silly might work for, I mean, certainly something like Exploding Kittens, okay? It's a funny game. I should have a funny video. You know, I should reassure you on some level that I can do what I say that I'm doing and that this really is going to be a fun game, not just amusing name and, and look. But I, I, it should be fun. I should laugh, you know, when I watch that video because this is a game that has to do with laughter. You know, um, so it, uh, and, and for a lot of that stuff too, you probably have to run it by people. Well, here's, Here's the, the product I'm doing, and here's what I want to, uh, here's how I want to do the video. What do you think of that? And then, oh, well, I don't know, Matt, that was, that was kind of not right for that kind of product or, you know, <laughs> uh, you know and, and, and get some opinions from a, a few different people whose, whose opinions you trust. And that um, give you a, a variety of perspectives. You know, never mind. It's kind of a random example, but I remember from back in my band days, one of our marketing, brilliant marketing ideas was just to go to, go to other concerts, you know, with local bands and hand out flyers, you know, for our concerts, you know, because that, you know, if they go to that, then maybe they'd come to ours. But I remember this one dude, he looked at our flyer and he's like, you know, I would never come to this show. I said, why not? And he says, well, you've got your your slogan here is like get it was like a silly thing, like get naked yeah. misspelled. I mean, it wasn't my idea, thankfully. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like kind of a goofball thing. And he's like, this is not, you know, your if your music is metal and your flyer is like goofy comedy stuff, it that doesn't, doesn't work, you know. Yeah. And I mean, I thought. You know, I, I, I was kind of uh, upset at first, but, you know, the more I thought about it, I'm like, you know, he's absolutely right. That day. He, he kind of done us a favor. <laughs> we need to rethink our. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that's uh, a... I didn't use the word cognitive dissonance. I didn't know what the heck that would mean, what that meant. But, you know, that's the idea. Right. But, you know, that's that is a key to marketing is there's a, uh, a great book by uh, Trout and Reese called Product Position and um, Product Position. Yeah, Trout and Reese, R-I-E-S-S, -S, I think it was. But, you know, their concept, which I always thought was, was quite valid, is that every product has a position, a mental spot in your mind. And you have to figure out what that is for a product. And then everything you do in a marketing sense, and that includes packaging and talking about a product, and should reflect and reinforce that position. And if you try to go against it, it's really hard. Once people form that position, you know, that, uh, yeah, positioning the battle for your mind. Uh, and <coughs> it is a great strategy book. And, and you know, for a, a good example, for instance, is when I say Cadillac, you think luxury car. You know, American luxury car, maybe I don't like them because I like Mercedes or, you know, but you think luxury car, you do not think inexpensive 
family car when I say Cadillac, right? Uh, or a, a better example, Volkswagen. When I say Volkswagen, you think an expensive family car, you know, or the people's car, or hey, it wasn't that the brand wasn't that the brand Hitler created? Yeah, well, we don't talk about that so much anymore. <laughs> but but you do you do not think luxury car. Well, Volkswagen, the Volkswagen Group owns Porsche and, and Audi, and they're, you know, they have exceptional engineering and everything else. And they at some point, some years ago, they decided we're going to build a bespoke luxury vehicle that's better than a Bentley or a Rolls. And, you know, it's going to be a $200,000 thing worth three or 400,000 because we know how to build a fine vehicle. And they built this beautiful sedan and um, nobody bought it because nobody wanted to spend $200,000 to put a VW logo on their driveway because that's not going to impress the neighbors, you know? And for most of the people who spend $200,000 on a car, it's about impressing the neighbors. Yeah. I've heard the same thing about Tesla's, you know, it's and, part about being green, but it's more importantly is that you want people to know I spent a lot of money. It's signaling, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, why, why do conspicuous consumption? Why do Gucci and Yves Saint Laurent bags have their logo all over it? You know, because see, see what I got? This is expensive <laughs> handbag. You know, what I this mean, old thing? <laughs> you know, uh, oh, that's last year's version, dear. You know, um, but um, you know, but Volkswagen found out the hard way that. I'm sorry, Volkswagen has a certain image in people's mind, and you're not gonna you're not gonna be able to sell a luxury car under that brand. You know, now Porsche can sell sports cars all day long, you know, and twice on Sundays because they they have a name and a rep in sports cars. But could they do a cheap Econo box? No, <laughs> they could, but nobody. Was, what the hell kind of a Porsche is that? You know. And, Oh, well, I don't know if I should spend $100,000 on a Porsche because there's this crappy $25,000 one out there that looks like shit. You know, it just wouldn't, it, it, it's, it, they're going against the product position they've established. But back that up to when you're creating a new product, part of the creation of the product plan is what is this product's position? What is this? You know, is this the, the best X ever made? Okay, you better be able to back that up, buddy. You know, or is this the, the uh, most unusual? Or we, we number two, we try harder. Or you know, is come up with a? Can you come up with a short phrase that embodies the most important selling point of your product? And then, can you create a campaign uh, of how you talk about it, how you package it? Uh, everything that goes out there that gets people to put that image in their heads. One of the best product pitches I ever heard at Electronic Arts back in the day was um, just two words for, you know, this developer wanted to do a game, okay? And he pitched the producers, uh, oh, they said, what's the game? And he said, Indiana Cousteau. And they all went, okay, I get that. That sounds cool. Here you go, here's a bunch of money. You know, because they understood that, you know, those two words at that time meant a lot. Oh, it's an underwater archaeologist. Also, we were talking about Indiana Cousteau. Yeah. So that was that was a great example of a, a really brief but memorable product positioning. And what I learned at Electronic Arts, because I was a product manager there, when I was hired, they said, well, we really have two different openings. We could make you an assistant producer or we could make you an assistant product manager. So you wanna be in the production department or the marketing department. And I said, you better put me in the marketing department because I'm afraid that I will make enemies in the, in the production department. It actually turned out the other way because I was the only one in the marketing department who knew anything about games. And so I made a lot of friends in the production department. Wow. Because, wow, they could talk to me and I understood and I had good ideas. And, you know, this was what the mid, mid 80s, I think. Yeah. It was like employee number 65 or something. So it was well, I got a number. <laughs> still pretty small. But, um, you know, so one of the things we had to do 
was tell the sales force who would go out to all the retail stores to sell the products. Uh, and, you know, they would go to the retail chains and they would, uh, the buyer would say, okay, what do you got for me this fall? Oh, I got these five products or three. Well, tell me about each one. And they would, oh, this is the latest uh, John Madden game. You know, okay, I've done, I know that, John, new John Madden. You know, what's this? Uh, what's this new one? I, I don't know, Indiana Cousteau. Oh, okay, I get it, you know. And, you know, the, the trick was you would try to create a product position that the salespeople would tend to repeat. And if they, if they were making up their own position and it wasn't yours, uh, well, I think it's about this or something like that, or, you know, it wouldn't be as effective and it wouldn't be exactly what you were hoping they would say. So that's the a defining way to look at a product position is, is if people you tell it to repeat it to other people the same way. I, I was able to phrase it memorably enough, you know, and really get at the core of what this product was about so that they, when people talk about it, they say the things about it that I think are important. You know, so you understand what I'm saying? It's yes. Were there some products that came through that they weren't able to do that with? Right. You know, a lot of times new products. I've never heard of this before. What is it? Oh, well, you know, I think it's about, uh, uh, it's some, you know, it's like you're, you're playing a, a, a warrior in a fantasy world and you're kind of wandering through and doing this, you know. You it's know, you get like lost. If, warrior, but not as good. You know. If you if you go on for sentence after sentence, you've lost them, right? You know, because you really only have a short window of time to convince somebody that this is something interesting. So, uh, yeah, it's like last year's game, only better. That's something they can. You know, that's <laughs> yeah, why you see so bad. many sequels, right? Because that's an easy sell. Uh, I forget who it was, but they were talking about the. When Pac-Man was being imported to the U.S., and there was a, another game called Rally X, and whoever it was over on this side thought that Rally X was going to be the big, the big hit, just because that was something they could wrap their heads around. But I mean, when people tried to explain what Pac-Man was, <laughs> yeah. it just sounded like the worst possible game ever. You know, the same thing with Sim City. Like, well, you get to be a tax manager or. or a city manager and do taxes and set oh, up that electricity. Sounds exciting! <laughs> I can't wait to do that. Well, I, you know, I'm I'm not here to tell you that product positioning is the be all and end all, right? Because we're not still playing Indiana Cousteau games, um, you know. But we are still playing Sim City, you know. And ultimately, for a lot of these games, it is the game itself. You know, would you play a game about a, a little Italian plumber who runs and jumps? Uh, that I don't really yeah. <laughs> it doesn't sound very interesting. It'll never fly, Orville. You know, um, you know but it, again, it's not so much the idea, it's the execution, right? And um, I mean, just for an example, I think for me, part of why Mario has been so successful were the little sounds, mm -hmm. you know, and the music. It was bright uh, and cheerful and chirpy and yeah, and, and you, you know, oh, I, I, I lost, you know, and oh, ba -ding, ba -ding, ba -ding, gold coins, you know, it was good reinforcement. I mean, unfortunately, mobile games have really glommed onto this in a big way, and they're, you know, uh, they've, too many of them are glorified Skinner boxes, and they're just about, you know, uh, tickling your, your uh, primal impulses to spend money, but and I mean, I think that is a concern from the industry going forward that, uh, you know, at some point you could squeeze people too much and then they'll start getting tired of being squeezed. I, I interviewed uh, the uh, CEO of, of Wargaming, Victor Kisley, and uh, I said, Victor, uh, you've been very successful with World of Tanks, you know, mostly in Europe, of course, because you know, the tanks are a big thing in Europe, right? And um, <clears throat> I said, but you don't seem to do much in the way of, of marketing to your player base. You know, why is that? 
And he said, well, he felt that, yeah, I, I could probably, let's say my average user in England spends 25 pounds a month. You know, and he, he has a good job. He comes home on the weekends. He buys uh, a, a new tank or he spends money on double XP weekends. And, you know, I get 25 pounds out. So you get 25 pounds out of them. So, so he gets 25 pounds a month, but he could, so I could boost it to 50 if I offered him sales and specials and, you know, this weekend, double XP for half price or whatever. He said, but if I do that after a couple of months, they're going to think I'm spending 50 pounds a month. That's way too much. And they'll stop. Uh, but, you know, if I give them enough value every month in and month out, I'm not pushing them. I can make 25 pounds a month out of that guy for years. That's, 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 some, that's wisdom right there. And I thought, like you, you know, don't want to get, you don't want to get greedy. In other words, he, right? he understands his market. Yeah. He understands the people who are spending the money. And uh, I, I do think a lot of it is value. Uh, why does League of Legends, you know, their revenue per user is, is amazing as a percentage. The people who play League of Legends, I think it's like 25 or 30% of them spend money in the game, which is, you know, with mobile games, oh, 2%. Yeah, that, then you're doing great, you know. Oh, yeah, look uh, at Magic the Gathering. My God, think of the, you know, but, boggles the mind. And, and League of Legends, they will sell you, this skin is $25. $25. And people are enjoying spending oh that was great that dj soda that oh she's terrific i love that skin the sounds the animations are wonderful they give people the value that they expect it's when wait a minute ten dollars for this horse saddle what the hell you know, <laughs> I, you know um, <clears throat> I, I mean we're, we're kind of getting close to the next question i was really wanted to do uh, tap your brain about the I know you do a lot of work with the within with advertising and game advertising. I guess you might have some thoughts on NFTs and sort of the stuff coming down the down the pipe. But uh, you know, it's it's hard to know what's what's gonna stick and what's just a fad and what's you should avoid at all costs. Well, I tell <laughs> I've you seen, that... I've seen some pretty prominent developers just get absolutely slammed for trying to well, do this NFT thing. The existing gaming audience does not like nfts and any developer should have realized that pretty early on and if not ubisoft gave them some good examples of you know why they should know that so your existing audience if you say nft to them they're going to go get away from <laughs> me with that shit you know it's, it's is, really like a visceral dis. <clears throat> I mean, they well, were really opposed. I, I understand it. I mean, um, the concept of playing to earn money and, and you're playing this game because you're trying to make money is antithetical to the reason why most people play these games right now. You know, I'm playing it because I'm having fun. I'm not playing it to make a living, but there were a lot of people in the Philippines who were playing Axie Infinity to make a living because it was better than the minimum wage, you know? Um, and the one thing the NFT games have done is they are, have been brilliant at raising money. They, they gathered a whole lot of investment. And there are a lot of people, and some of them I know, and some of them are very smart, that are building NFT games and NFT gaming. Uh, <clears throat> and my feeling is that the technology will be around and there will probably be successful games that involve NFTs at some point you know, long-term success, not just, hey, for six months, this did really well, and then it crashed, you know. Um, but it's, it's going to be a different type of thing. It is, um, it is not going to involve the current gaming audience. There's no reason to use the blockchain to track items in a game. You can do that perfectly well with your own database that you are in charge of. And for that matter, spending money in a game I mean, the, what the NFT proponents will tell you as well, it'll be on a blockchain and it doesn't have to depend on this game. You could then take it other places. Well, that only de that depends on the other game companies implementing that. And if your thing is, there is no reason why my game company should support your NFT. 
what's in it for me? I don't get any money out of it. Somebody spent money on you and I don't get a share in it. Yeah, and you bought so, that saddle. That was a different game. You got that saddle for We're not going to, why would we let you use it in this game? Why would I pay one of my developers for a week or two to implement that saddle in my game, even if it was just cosmetic? And boy, if it had actual game impact and was integrated into the game in some way, that's way harder, you know, and that may screw up my balance. Yeah, not to mention, I would imagine some kind of copyright issues you can get into with something like uh, that. You know, it, it's it's a legal can of worms, too. Uh, and I, you know, I don't see... I don't see the incentives there for publishers to support that. Um, so there, there has to be reasons for players to do it, but there also has to be reasons for publishers and developers to support it because they don't have infinite resource. You know, I, I've got to pay my developers uh, and I'm going to pay them to do things that I think will make me money. And supporting your supporting things that other people pay for in other places that I never see a cent on, I'm not going to pay him to do that, you know. Um, so I mean, there there are efforts underway to create an avatar standard that different things can support, and you know that may okay, but that's not under the purview of one publisher. And maybe if publishers sign on to support that, I can see it. Uh, I mean, like what didn't the we have something like that the we little we characters you know yeah um i don't think you ever got to use those anywhere else no and that's the that's the issue is um and and for that matter if i spend money on the item in this game and then you shut the servers down what good is that item you know whether it's an <laughs> nft or not if I if your game is no longer operating, what the hell good does it do? Yeah, I think I always think about all the folks that spend all that money on Second Life, you know, buying up islands and properties and all the stuff. Yeah. yeah, and there's nothing that says you you are forced to continue operating your servers forever. Like, you know? well, this is just like buying a real piece of property, but it's not. <laughs> the real piece of property is still there when you turn off your servers, you know. But um, so. I am, and, and also so many of these game, NFT game pitches that I've seen, almost all of them, they spend all their time talking about their technology and their NFTs. And it's like, you know, I don't care about your plumbing. Is your game fun? You know, and if they're not talking about the game, my, impl my inference is that your game is not fun because you're not talking about your game. You know, my technology is really cool. Okay, great. I'll grant you that, but is your game any fun? And always, once I've seen it, sounds like they don't even understand games or know anything about them. They're just kind of latched onto this NFT trend or whatever you want to call it. And they're like, that's going to sell the thing. Well, this is why games are like porn. You know, it's the first place that people look to make money on a new technology. Uh, you know, VR, go oh, games, games, you know, and porn, you know, those will be money makers. No. You, know, you know, speaking of VR, you know, I was looking at some of your older uh, games industry biz. Now, these were from like seven, eight years ago. I got a hoot because I mean, what what is old is new again. Yeah, and it's like all the it's like seven years old, but you could have wrote it yesterday. <laughs> well, that that means I did a good job writing it. <laughs> I wasn't being active. You didn't started. see the day. I mean, the names have changed, but it's like the same old thing. We're we're kind of living through it again now. There's like, well, VR, and you know, got this Facebook Meta you know, yeah. thing. I mean, it's not like that's anything really new. You know, people have been talking about that sort of thing at least for decades, right? And the, yeah. I mean, Gerald yeah. Lanier was doing stuff in the early uh, 90s and, you know. I mean, do you see anything really coming down the pipe that would be revolutionary in, with I, any of that stuff? Or is it just <clears throat> I think that I, I played a lot of different VR things. I, I really did enjoy, for instance, the, uh, the thing that Lucasfilm Labs did with uh, playing a, 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 a Jedi, you know, and, and deflecting stormtrooper bolts. And, you know, that was, okay, that was cool. I could see that little tech yeah. demo. Um, but the key, when, when it will become a big market is when someone will spend hundreds of hours in it, whether in four hour chunks or four minute chunks, you know, 
but that's that's with mobile games okay there are mobile games that generate more than a billion dollars every year and if you had said that 10 years ago that there will be mobile games that will generate more than a billion dollars every year people would look at you and say you know what are you smoking uh you know um <clears throat> that'll never happen and um Oh, yeah, just like China would never be the world's largest game market. Oh, no, you know, they got tired of doing that. So now they're trying to be smaller, but they're working hard at it uh, and succeeding. Um, but uh, the problem with VR has been the cost of the hardware, and it's been uncomfortable to wear for long periods of time. And some of the things are compelling, like Beat Saber, you know, and they've made a few million off of that. Um, but I, until, I can't imagine. I mean, could you survive a hundred hours with that thing on? No, I mean, you know, I, mean, I don't know what the cold. world record is for like how long you're able to stand. <laughs> yeah, and and um, I guess you have to eat unless they can feed you somehow. Well, it's like Niantic, you know, was convinced that Pokemon Go was that's the future of gaming is yeah, that's the uh, is wandering around with your phone and you know. Uh, acting like an idiot in public places and getting people to walk and getting people outside. And I'm so glad to hear somebody describe it in a negative way. Thank you. It's, I mean, it's great. It's made a shit ton of money. Okay. No argument there, but they had this perfect, perfect confluence between the nature of the IP and the game and the gameplay. And it really wasn't AR, you know, just a little bit of, bling on the top, you know, of the AR. You could turn the AR off and it would still be the same gameplay. Um, and it, you know, really only works well if you're in a city or, you know, you're in a fairly populated area, you move outside of that and, you know, this is no fun. <laughs> but they kept trying with Harry Potter and, you know, they'll, they'll keep trying to do location-based gaming and, you know, they've made enough money on that, they can experiment with other things and figure out over time that it, it's not really that big. It was just people love Pokemon, you know? Uh, it, it's like Kim Kardashian Hollywood was a great example of finding the perfect game to fit the license. You know, if they had a game already that was about hanging out with a celebrity and doing celebrity type things. And, and they got Kim Kardashian to license her likeness and name and everything with it. And to her credit, Kim Kardashian was hugely important in the marketing of that game. She would text people who were players, you know, just out of the blue. And they would, just, oh, my God, Kim Kardashian sent me a text. Look at this. Oh, my God. You know, and tell all her friends. And, you know, she worked at it because it was her biggest moneymaker for years. Right. Wow. Uh, and and so Glue Mobile said, hey, wow, this is the future. We're going to do uh, licensed celebrity mobile games and we'll make a shit ton of money. And, you know, we'll do uh, Gordon Ramsay and we'll do uh, Jason Statham and we'll do, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And guess what? Jason Statham fans don't really want to hang out with Jason Statham. You know? <laughs> uh, you yeah, know, they don't like to watch him out. kick butt. Gordon Ramsay, is that somebody you don't want to hang I'd be afraid to hang out with him. Yeah, I mean, Gordon he is a cool guy, a great chef and all, but I, I don't really want to, you know. Like he can make up, different... I'll eat some eggs if he wants to make some eggs, but I don't know if I want to have a. Yeah, they had different gameplay. I don't, don't realize... want to yell that. <laughs> well, they realized that it has to be a different game than Kim Kardashian, right? But, but Kim Kardashian was perfect because it was targeting teenage girls who were socially involved, so they would, you know, put it out on all their social media, and it was, you know, it grabbed a huge number these are these are the people who are the fans of kim kardashian anyway so you know they were the uh the perfect again it was the perfect product position and the perfect product it was also not replicable and it took them quite a number of other games to realize that no you, you know that's not going to work you can't just yeah, that's the thing and we've talked about a couple examples of that Seems like Nintendo's really good at coming out with these really great ideas that just aren't replicable. Yeah, they catch lightning in a bottle, and hey, I got the same type of bottle, and it's a different color lightning. But I think it'll, no, it doesn't doesn't work that way. You know, um, so it's. But I think the ultimate thing is that marketing is more important than ever 
to games and that especially independent game makers need to understand that and embrace that. And I submit that you shouldn't even begin spending money on your independent game project unless you have a good marketing plan for it, unless you have a reason to believe you will find an audience and it's a sufficient size and you can motivate them to spend money on your game and you have all these steps figured out, uh, you know, don't even start. Don't even, you know, come up with a different idea. You're creative. You know, you came up with that idea. You could probably come up with a dozen more if you were compelled to. So come up with an idea that when you analyze it from a marketing perspective, you go, oh yeah, wow. I, I think there's a market for that. The, the, there are these people who would love something like that and they're not getting something like that now. This is different than what they're getting. Or I can, I have a way to, to communicate with that audience. I can connect to those people. I can show them what I'm doing. Now, it doesn't make it any easier to build a great game. You know, you still got all that work ahead of you. But at least when you've built that thing, you have more reason to believe you can make money off of that thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think with indie game makers, that's the part they miss. You know, know, it's funny. This is so common in like the book publishing world where, you know, if you know what you're doing, you don't just write an entire book and then try to find a publisher. Right. You, You pitch it and you discuss it. And if, you know, if nobody bites, you just move on to another proposal, right? Whereas it seems like with games, for whatever reason, we're stuck in this idea that you have to make the game. <laughs> well, I mean, I understand. And try to put it out there. You try to do a slice, maybe like you do a sample chapter or three, you know, for your game, especially if yeah. you, I haven't sold the a book demo, like this before. Sort of thing. Yeah. Try to make people understand the gameplay or the benefit, you know, or give them a reason to believe. That's why my approach with what I'm doing is a hybrid of tabletop and mobile. I am trying to get the play test together in the next few weeks, and I plan to play test it for a couple of months. While I'm play testing, I will be refining my pitch for uh, development dollars for the app and using the feedback that I gather from play testers to first of all, improve the game, but second to inform that, well, this is, I, I now have so many people who have played this and this is what they've said about it. Or, you know, I'll just keep rinsing and repeating until I get them to say something nice or I'll give up on it because then yeah, nobody ever, after trying it again and again, yeah, no, Steve, it's not really that interesting or you know, it sort of works, but not really the way you think. Uh, and I'm sure, I, I can make a list of what I think are the top 10 most important things about it. And whatever the play testers come up with will not be anywhere near my list. Right. You know, what I thought was number one might not even be on the list that they come up with. So that's part of what you learn in the play testing process is what's really important to people who are playing it. But so my idea is, so if I play test it and it's successful, then I, uh, in the play test, I can, Uh, do a Kickstarter for a book. And while I'm doing that, be pitching uh, Mm -hmm. the money for the development, because what I want to do in software has, uh, you know, some very different parts to it that will allow it to be useful to a much larger audience. What I want to do is with the initial app, it will help people tabletop role play and get that tabletop experience with their friends through an app, you can sort of do that with messaging apps, but I think there's more comprehensive things you can do in a better way uh, than just using a messaging app. Uh, <clears throat> and, then, and then add to that, what I want to be able to do is have the app stand in for a game master, have what I call group solo adventures, where you're adventuring against a story individually or with some friends, and it takes you through, it's like a choose your own adventure, right? Because really tabletop role-playing, when you break it down and analyze it, it's essentially either you're in combat, you're in conversation, you're interacting with the environment in some way, or there's some narrative going on, you know? Now you've approached the, you know, 
lakeshore village of such and such. That's narrative, okay? You talk to the villagers, that's conversation. You cut the villager's head off, that's combat, you know, or you look around to see if the villager had anything of value that's interacting with the environment, okay? And essentially, you could take all the different stuff that happens in role-playing games and, and stuff it in one of those four boxes. And those are the same boxes that you would use in a choose your own adventure story, or there are games that use that structure. I wrote a Tolkien quest um, novel set in Middle Earth that was essentially a game with a choose your own adventure structure. Um, but the, uh, <clears throat> anyway, if, if I can make the software capable of dealing with those things, uh, and, and dealing with a simple structure, uh, I think people would enjoy doing that as a group and ideally give them the tools to make their own uh, such standalone adventures or characters. Mm -hmm. What I want to have is put an adventure game store in people's pocket so that, you know, I can buy weapons and items and adventures and characters and, uh, and animations and I can maybe create them and put them in a store and sell them to other players. Um, because I think user generated content is hugely important. And there's a lot of, of games like Minecraft or Roblox where that has yeah, become, just think of that. Yeah. That, that has become incredibly important. Um, but I want to focus on the story part of it rather than the visual part of it. I want to work with Roll20 and with all the other tabletop things because I, I'm not intent on doing what they do. They already are very far along that path and they're doing some really cool things. There's other cool ones coming up. I want to work with them because what I want to focus on is the story and character and individual part of that and be uh, something that assists with what they're doing, which is great showing a map and you know moving figures around on it and visualizing what's going on. That is so cool. Uh, but what is not cool is me having to spend dozens of hours creating that map and populating it and doing all that work. It's hard enough to be a game master already. And there have been game master tools for decades that would allow you to do all this stuff. Now they're getting more sophisticated and the results are better and better. But the bottom line is they still want you to spend hours and hours and hours doing the work. And granted, there are some people who love doing that and will do that. The people who've made incredible worlds in Minecraft, you know, unbelievable. And they have generated billions of hours of YouTube videos and people watching it and they've generated this audience for Minecraft. But what percentage of total Minecraft players actually spend that amount of time doing that stuff? You know, it's probably in the single digits, I would imagine, you know. And similarly, uh, I, I don't want to require that. I would like you to be able to just sit down and just out of your head, hey, let's play. I'm going to give you the scenario and maybe I'll pull some images in from the internet or I'll, you know, take some stuff that I bought or and tweak it or spend a little bit of time. And then it'll keep track of what we did each week and give me ideas about what to do next week mm -hmm. and how to keep things going. But keeping the, the story going the story that we're jointly creating together going that's the missing link i think that nobody is really addressing they're focusing on it's like electronic computer games for so long have been focused on a map you know bard's tale for instance that was you know uh ultima world war guys it was all about the map they spent a lot of time building the map and putting things on the map. And here's the dungeon and here's this bad guy and here's this town. And you get these kind of encounters here and all that. Why? Because maps are easy to program. The programmers can wrap their heads around that. Okay, that's straightforward. Mm -hmm. You know, I get that. You know, we have a grid, we have coordinates, it's you know, and a lot of work for the artists, but we know how to program that. But if I tell you, program me an interrelated set of stories, uh, uh, how do I do that? You know, crap, what, what, uh, show me the numbers. I don't, you know, I mean, I'm a programmer, you know, give me, give me something I can grab. Well, you have to turn the stories into numbers somehow. 
and that's hard you know um so that's why and then and then dialogue is the same way you know how i want to have conversations well hell how do i do that you know i don't want to i can't generate an ai that sounds like a person because that's way too hard oh well maybe we just have a set of different phrases and you pick one you know? um, <clears throat> But I think there are ways around some of these issues, but mm. it you have to understand that it comes down to what's easy to, pro, or what is programmable. Can I turn something into a concept that a programmer can get their hands around and put into code? You know, so, you know, you have to take these ephemeral nebulous things and stop describing them in nebulous terms and turn them into numbers, you know? Well, that's a plus one. Okay, I can program that. Well, we have to implement it. Yeah, I was. You remember the uh, Farmville? Yeah. Yeah. One of the things I, I think about that game. You know, I guess I realize it's kind of. I don't even know if anybody plays it anymore, but you know, when that was the, a hot item, one of the things that I remember impressing me about it was that people liked helping other people. You know, it was like. They want to go to your, you, you You can't make it or you've ignored your farm for a while. So it like say, why don't you go help Steve, you know, go mow his grass or, <laughs> you know, there's like that sort of communal, like I'm helping somebody out element. And I was, I've always thought, I wonder why other games don't have something like this. You know, like with the world of Warcraft, for example, like some way to like, it's not just maybe your friends can't get online that day, but there's something you could do you know, to help them out. It, it is hard. Um, I think it's a fundamental design decision you have to make early on. And I think um, it is hard to figure out how to help other people without unbalancing things. You know, I, I don't want to make it too easy for them, you know, uh, and then the game becomes no fun if it, oh, I can, here, let me give you this plus five set of armor. And now you can blow through the first 20 levels of, you know, uh, <clears throat> so you have to figure out why can't I do that? I mean, it has been interesting watching for years, Sony and with EverQuest, you know, they were trying to crush people who would sell things online. You know, no, you can't sell EverQuest items on eBay. How dare you? We will prosecute, you know. And it's like, yeah, no, the lesson should have been, Sony, people want to sell these things. Give them a way to do it in the game and take a cut. Duh, you know. And, and I mean, they tried with Diablo 3 in the auction house. And, oh, well, we screwed that up. Too. Oh, my God. I remember that controversy. What a horrible, you know. But it doesn't mean that the concept is yeah, bad. The concept, because the concept, I think, makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> for some people want to do that. I want to, you know, I put all this time into this game. I created this thing or I found this thing or I bought this thing or whatever. And I want to sell it to you. Give me a way to do that if you can. You know, if That's you can. one of the things that Second Life did well. Yeah, and I think that, that's a place where role-playing games can do much better, you know, in general. Um, but again, you have to, they have to approach it with that in mind, uh, you know, when they're building things. Uh, I think it's hard to retrofit stuff. The problem with World of Warcraft has been, for the development side, that, you know, why does it take so long to do an add-on? Well because it takes a long time to create all that new territory but you know the structure got so rickety over time that oh adding 10 more levels on the top end no we're gonna have to change a whole lot of numbers and everything kind of breaks and we have to you know it's it's bolting stuff onto the top of this increasingly you know rickety thing that uh, oh we never we never created a foundation that was going to be good enough to uh i mean that's that's a problem with role-playing games, with many role-playing games. Uh, D&D, for instance. Anybody will tell you that D&D works best in the range from third level to eighth level. And, uh, you know, before third level, you die too easily. And after eighth level, you become ridiculously powerful and everything becomes binary. Uh, did you save? Great, you're fine. Did you fail? You're dead. You know, uh, and, and especially... At the higher end for wizards, it's like, oh, I wish you were all dead. Okay, okay, poof, you're all dead. That that's that was we're done. Runs over. Uh, 
you know, they, uh, I think they, they released some figures on how many people play and there's like, like only 2% play characters above 10th level or something, you know, it's just really small. And so then why do they write things that require, you have to be a 12th level wizard to get this or whatever. It's like, yeah, why are you wasting everybody's time? You know, if, but, it, but again, it, it, um, it gets hard because the game system was designed around a certain area of numbers. And then once you got beyond that, it didn't work so well. Um, that's why what we tried to do with uh, champions and the hero system was encourage people to broaden their capabilities. But by putting caps on combat and other things, we said, you know, okay, once you get whatever your campaign is set at, it's 12 dice is the max and the game master might let you go a little bit beyond it if they want to, but generally speaking, that's it. Oh, okay, so I can't just add more dice to my attack. Well, maybe I'll pick up a new skill or I'll learn a new power or I'll take away one of my disadvantages or, you know. And, and so you would then, because we didn't deal with the concept of this overall level, you moved up a level and all these things got better. No, you, you got some points and you could spend them on whatever you wanted, you know, and then you could broaden capabilities. I, I mean, I could spend them on my base. You know, I could buy a castle and populate it with guards and spend experience points on that, you know. Uh, and, yeah, so it, it, but, you know, people enjoyed that and it kept them from moving out of the range of, of the game's ability to deal with, right? Kind of like horizontal expansion instead of exactly vertical. And it's tough, you know, when you have, I mean, the DC universe is a great example. There are characters like Superman, and then there's characters like Batman. If Superman ever landed a full power punch on Batman, he'd be tomato paste. Uh, you know, so you have to find ways that they can both be involved in a story and both have something compelling to do. Well, we'll have Superman fight the big ugly thing while Batman goes around here and figures out yeah. what's really happening or, you know. Uh, so it is difficult when you have characters that are so far apart in terms of their capability. And that's true, whether it's superheroes or fantasy or any genre, you know, uh, you want to keep their combat capabilities at least in the same range, or you have to have the combats have to be segregated. Now this is for the big boys and this is for the intellectuals over here. You know? uh, you're the skill-based character. You go deal with that. Uh, I've heard the only way to generate any real tension in a Superman story is that you can't be two places at once. Well, you know, for many, many years of Superman comics, the stories were either Superman was not around where he needed to be, or he forgot he could do something until the very end. Oh, yeah, I have this power. <laughs> and that takes care of it, you know. Well, that's that's great storytelling. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, but that's what, that's why people were reading Marvel comics instead of DC comics, because Superman comics were boring. It wasn't until they dialed him back, you know, and, and started to say, well, he's not just incredibly, infinitely powerful in every circumstance, that it got a lot more interesting, you know. I mean, it was still problematic, a lot of stories still involved. Oh, well, now that I found out about this, whoop, I'm here and okay, <laughs> problem solved. Um, but you, you know, Superman initially he wasn't that strong. Lifting a car over his head was incredible. You know, he he could leap. You know, he could leap a tall building. He could run faster than a locomotive. That's impressive. He couldn't fly for years. You know, um, and uh, you know the character just became ridiculous after a time, and all the DC characters suffered from that in the 60s and into the 70s of being, uh, you know, a Green Lantern. And he could basically do anything unless it was yellow. And then he couldn't do anything. You know, so, I mean. Yeah, yeah we were talking about this on, I think it was Discord the other day, about how many, it seemed like every new game ratchets up the stakes. And it's, it, we've gotten to this point where every game is like, if you, your goal is to save the universe. 
Yeah. Well, it, it is hard. Yeah, like, how do you go beyond that now? I mean, why, what, what happened to like smaller stakes? Do you, does it have to be about saving the cosmos every time? I mean, <laughs> yeah. First, it was I stopped this threat to the city. And so the right. next movie, we stopped the threat to the world. And then we stopped the threat to the universe. And then we stopped the threat to all the universes. <laughs> yeah, one universe uh, got to save all the universes. Okay. You know, how do you, how do you go back to, you know, it's, I mean, then one of the things that I really liked about, spider-man no way home and i enjoyed the tom holland movies i have enjoyed all the spider-man movies but what i really liked about no way home was at the end of it spoiler alert i'm going to reveal something about the ending but at the end of it he is really now back to the original spider-man he's all on his own he has no special friends with incredible power he has no special suit with incredible power he He's just all by himself, you know, and he's just your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man trying to help, but he doesn't have Stark Industries and a super suit and he doesn't have all these Avenger friends and, you know, which is, I think, great because where does the story go from here? Anywhere they want to, you know, does he regain his friends? Does he, you know, uh, do, does he... What does he do? I don't know. And I like that. You know, I think that gives them great potential to do interesting things in the next movie. Well, Steve, we've been going on for over two hours here. I don't know what your time looks like. I, you have time for a couple more? Sure. If you have, we should, you can always edit me down as much as you no, want. No, 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 no. I, I don't want to edit anything down. I just don't want to, you know, if, <laughs> impose too hey, much on my you. wife edits me down all the time so you know and i well, tell I her know that, what that's like mine just puts me on mute i think yeah uh i wanted to talk about a few things just maybe briefly whatever you want to say but we we can't not talk more i think about you your time at tsr so definitely want to circle back to that a little bit and then just for just for kicks I, i'm just a big fan of new tech you know, I was just always fascinated by their all the video toasters and the you know, <laughs> did you paint that that whole world? But uh, anyway, I'm pretty sure that might be limited to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, briefly, uh, I got, very different I got, topics, but yeah, maybe we just do the TS there. I, I got involved with New Tech um, <clears throat> through a coworker at EA, Paul Montgomery, and he had started the first Amiga users group. So I helped him run the first Amiga users group and got involved with Tim Jennison through that. And I helped uh, create uh, the packaging and the manual for DigiPaint and the marketing for that. And then uh, when I left EA, Tim brought me on to help uh, with DigiView and DigiPaint uh, for the Amiga, which were a video digitizer and a paint program. I was the, I had been the product manager for Deluxe Paint at Electronic Arts. And oh, okay. Arts. Yeah, that was... A I was we could talk about that all day. Sure, I was product manager for all the productivity products. That was so an awesome deluxe video, deluxe music construction set, all of those instant music. So I had a lot of fun with that stuff. But uh, and so I was there at New Tech when Tim was working on the video toaster. I remember when he called me in his office and showed me uh, video uh, playing off of a computer hard drive, and I said, "That's pretty cool," you know, because that was pretty cool at that time. I still have my Amiga 2000 with a toaster card inside. Oh, um, really? Um, I don't even know if it works anymore, but I still have it. But uh, but that was that was fun. Uh, and yeah, uh, Penn, Gillette, um, Penn and Teller are friends of Tim's, and I still remember uh, calling Tim one time, and he was in. Vegas for uh, like the broadcast um, trade show, and he had Penn Gillette answer the phone, and I, you know, Tim, no, this is Penn. Who the hell is this? You know, and so I was like, ah, uh, you know, wow, big fan, you know, and but it was really weird. It was it was pretty funny though, uh, and uh, so I enjoyed working with with Tim on that. I think it was a hugely important product. For the uh, uh, for the time of the market and um, uh, Babylon Five obviously was 
based all around the toaster's capability. It was, you know, it was a very, very interesting time. So I learned a lot about video and, and I think like to think I helped a lot with those products. But um, anyway, um, the TSR story, shifting to that, uh, I got a call from Peter Atkinson in 97 or somewhere around there. I don't know, but he said, hey, Steve, I just bought TSR. Would you come and help me move the marketing to Seattle? And I said, okay. So he flew me out to Wisconsin and I spent three weeks in Wisconsin at the TSR offices, uh, kind of packing things up and going through things and, and uh, you know, ended up in Seattle as director of marketing for TSR and um, had to come up with marketing plans and, you know, D and D third edition was coming up and it was, it was an exciting time. I knew most of the people at TSR already, of course, from uh, just hanging out at Gen Con with them, but I got to know a lot of them a lot better. And it was, that was fun. And um, <clears throat> what my favorite part about that too was uh, Peter moved all the furniture from uh, TSR Sheridan Springs headquarters out to Seattle and it was it was on uh, an unoccupied floor of the building that, that Wizards of the Coast was renting and <clears throat> he didn't know what to do with it because it wasn't like stuff that they could use they had cubicles and you know standard office stuff and Lorraine in the executive area of TSR had all this reproduction antiques and you know beautiful stuff cool it was thing. very it was very interesting. The executive area had this thick, expensive green carpeting. And you, if you stepped off that into the threadbare, thin carpeting, oh, this is where the, the writers and editors and designers work, you know, dimly lit cubicle maze, and, you know, but Lorraine's area, beautiful offices and uh, reproduction antique furniture and everything. Yeah, I think I see where some of the problem may have occurred to this. And... <laughs> So Peter, uh, just they, they did a, an auction on the company intranet. And I told my wife, I said, there's some really, there's some nice looking furniture there. And it's like, you know, dirt cheap. And she said, go for it, you know? So I ended up bidding against the COO who was uh, Vince Calori, who had come from Boeing, you know? And, and he won a, a nice old federal bookcase with an eagle and all this cool stuff. But I, I did end up furnishing my living room because uh, we were in the, we, I had to put it in storage for a while, but I, I got the sofa and chairs and table and a couple of chairs from the uh, waiting area outside Lorraine's office. And I got the display cabinet that was in the lobby full of Buck Rogers figures. And that's now in my front hallway. So I tell people my house is decorated in late period TSR. <laughs> That's good. The buffet that was in the sideboard that was in Jim Ward's office is in my living room, and you know, uh, so and the whole, all of that furniture, I think it was like twelve hundred dollars or something together, and you know, so I was like, hey, this is great. That's insane. That was, you know, wow. Uh, so yeah, that was. Uh, so I hope your guests are suitably impressed. And they and they shipped it down too, included in that. So uh, you know, so I was I was very pleased. Um, so yeah, that's so any my I heard that their marketing was I guess before you arrived anyway, somewhat lacking or chaotic and they really needed some some vision, some coherence. Yeah, I tried to pull together. I mean, I, I was dealing with this is what we have, you know, and this is what we have coming up. And I tried to uh, tried to unify it and created shelf talkers. I had a whole I have a whole package of marketing stuff, the window clings and shelf talkers and other things to help retailers uh, sell the product and. Um, Hopefully, it had some impact at the time. The retailers I talked to seemed to like it. So, uh, but it was a very different environment, and of course, part of their problem was they didn't have any unity behind what they were doing. It was just, hey, we got this great idea. Let's do that. Okay, let's do this. And 
um, the new book that came out kind of really well described um, TSR's downfall. Um, uh, I forget the guy's name, but he, everybody, he interviews the book. I know they're friends of mine. So, you know, I could, whenever I read the quotes, it was, I could hear their voices saying these things, you know, and I learned some stories that I hadn't heard before. Um, but uh, I think Peter made an exceptional choice. And I'm sure Wizards of the Coast would agree now because that's, uh, that and magic are responsible for many sure, percent sure. of the problem. Well, thanks for taking the, the time, Steve. And this has been a great chat. Well, is there any other topics that you feel like we need to I, I think we've covered far more ground. And I uh, <laughs> you know, hope your audience can wake up after the soporific. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, we could go. We'll have to have you back to talk about Capcom and some of these other other topics. I mean, there, there are stories that how Resident Evil got named and, you know, Okay, well, we got to do that. Uh, All that sort of stuff. <laughs> there's some fun stories, some fun Capcom stories. But, All right. Well, well thank uh, you, Matt. Yeah, thanks yeah. again. Fabulous. Thanks to, to Sue for setting this up. And... I will look forward to uh, seeing the end result. And I'll uh, help spread the word about it. When we have oh, it. there we go. <laughs> I got I to help with the marketing, right? Yeah. Well, thanks again. Okay, thank you. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, should be back soon, uh, either with an interview or another uh, a gaming play. Retrospective, always love to do those. Uh, if there's somebody in particular or a game you'd like to see on the show, uh, just sound off in those comments. Always love to hear from you. As well as what you thought about this episode, uh, you can discuss it here at YouTube or, of course, on the Discord channel for Matt Chat. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 verily, <laughs> super duper much for supporting the show, keeping these episodes in production. You know, we wouldn't be here without you. Uh, this show would have ended a long time ago. You guys seem to like Mad Chat. You know, you're, you're, you're watching the episodes. Uh, you're, you're having fun with these interviews. I know I am. If you want to support the show and you haven't done so already, you know, uh, maybe it's time. Maybe this is the time. <laughs> so, uh, just go to that link in the show notes. There's a Patreon page. There's a PayPal thing you can get to if you prefer to do that. Uh, if there's some other way you want to support the show, just let me know. You know, maybe you have some uh, some games. You know, you like this. <laughs> like, well, I don't see a copy of blah, blah, blah on the shelf. You know, you might have an extra one. Hey, you know, I'd be happy to take that off your hands. You know, I'm just saying there's lots of ways to support the show. Uh, but however you do it, thank you. I really, really appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, thank you one more time. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> you know, I bet you've been playing uh, Oblivion from time to time, uh, <laughs> and you thought, man, wouldn't it be great if I could order Domino's Pizza right here in the game and not even have to stop playing uh, to use an app or to make a phone call? Well, <laughs> your prayers have been answered, and <laughs> Nikki's Pizza Oblivion. Yes, yes, yes. The bunny sent this in. So order Domino's Pizza. You just talk to Pizza Nikki's Black outside Weya, or W-E-Y-E, -E, near the entrance to the Imperial City Bridge and go from there. So apparently it doesn't always work, but, you know, when it works, it works. <laughs> you get yourself a, uh, Domino's Pizza. I'm pretty sure it even comes with breadsticks, folks. I mean, you know, what, what would they think of that? What mod... You know, could there be that <laughs> thought about? You know, I would, you know, where is this pizza thing Domino's been? You know, this does kind of open up a an interesting opportunity, though. You know, if it works, it's got to work with me here, right? So maybe these restaurant franchises are like, hmm, well, why Domino's? What maybe maybe they want to put a, a 
uh, Papa John's in there and have some <laughs> different options. You know, uh, thinking about this interview I just did and all this talk about in, you know, advertising, monetization, and so on. Hey, if you want to order uh, food or whatever the case is as you're playing a game, you know, maybe you could, uh, maybe they could offset some of the cost of the game. You get it for free, but you know, you might be <laughs> tempted <laughs> to order Domino's or. or whatever the case may be as you're playing. I, I don't know, I'm just kind of being silly. But it does raise some interesting possibilities, doesn't it? You know, maybe next time you're in one of these taverns in Baldur's Gate, you're like, yeah, I'll take the Dwarven Ale. Next thing you know, it shows up. <laughs> Ding dong! <laughs> Here's the Dwarven Ale. It's real. Uh, okay. Uh, speaking of Baldur's Gate, Richard Simmons wrote in about this. You know, I'm very humbled to have Richard Simmons as a fan of the show. He's one of my favorite people, as you probably know. I have all the tapes here, sweating to the oldies, and oh, he's got a bunch of other stuff. He's a deal a meal, remember that? Uh, anyway, he's a Mad Chat fan. You can talk to him on Discord. Okay, uh, yeah, he wrote in about this. A lot of people have been talking about this. I've been talking about this. There's a Baldur's Gate and Beyond Humble Bundle. This is called the RPG Legends. And folks, this is some of the best. <clears throat> best of the best RPGs ever. You got Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate 2, Enhanced. Uh, it's got, I think, Planescapes in there. Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous. You know, it's worth it just for that. Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous is in there. Yeah, Torment's in there. I thought there was a couple other ones here. Yeah, Neverwinter Nights is in there. I don't think Neverwinter Nights 2. You know, what is the deal with Neverwinter Nights 2? It's like the, you know, the forgotten one right, or something. Yeah, it's a good game. I don't know. They should do something. <laughs> Where is that game? I, I don't know. Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, yeah. So this is $205 worth of games. But you can pay what you want. And with a Humble Bundle, I think some of the money or all of the money, I'm not sure what the percentage is, but uh, it's for charity. Uh, so you're kind of doing a good thing it's for society. At the same time, you're picking up some great games. And I think these are on Steam. Uh, you know, I don't have that note here, but I'm pretty sure that's what I saw in the comments. So uh, Anyway, yeah, RPG Legends. And then finally, uh, Rich, speaking of Richard Simmons, wrote in about this. Uh, there's a game called Oregon Trail. I have it down here. You guys can't, uh, can't see it. Uh, I did a match out on it way back in the day. It's one of those games a lot of people played in school, at least if you're uh, uh, from America. I don't think it got to Europe. Uh, so a lot of times, you know, I talk about Oregon Trail and dysentery and all this. And, uh, my European viewers are like, what the hell is that? You know? <laughs> it's just kind of this... A sort of wacky uh, early educational game about these you uh, have a wagon you're trying to get some settlers across at the trail Oregon Trail was this famous uh, sort of I guess you'd call it kind of a path of immigration really you know, from this side of the US over uh, to the other side it was very dangerous historically and a lot of people didn't make it and this game was kind of uh, famous because it had a lot of dark humor you know it didn't try it wasn't one of these cuddly wuddly little cutesy wootsy kind of educational games. I mean, this was like, <laughs> Matt has died. You know, he died of a horrible disease or got bitten by a snake. I mean, there's all sorts of ways you could die in this game. Okay, anyway, that's uh, all to say that the developers of, uh, or directors rather, of Lyle Lyle Crocodile, whatever the heck that is, duo Pasek and Paul, are making a musical about the Oregon Trail. And I wanted to read a little bit of their commentary here, because I think this is kind of spot on. Uh, this is coming from those guys. They say, the game always had this dark band of humor running through it, because your chances of dying from everything from dysentery to a cut to anything was basically every movie ended up dying. We were returning a little bit to our roots, marrying it with the fun of doing a big musical, and also that... Uh, and also very seriously as well, and making a big historical westward expansion epic that's also about dying from dysentery. So it sounds like they're going to keep that element of dark humor, which I think will be key. All right, well, let's wrap it up with a quotation. And you probably heard the, the sad news that Angela Lansbury has passed away. I mean, she was 96. And she lived to a ripe old age. You know, it would have been nice to, for her to make it to 100, just to kind of have a nice round number. But I'm sure she's satisfied <laughs> with 96. <laughs> you know, I would definitely be. Uh, but anyway, she's got a lot of great quotes, but I really like this one. I think it's, uh, you know, I think everybody can relate to this to some degree, at least those of us who are 
getting uh, not getting any younger, uh, shall we say, goes something like this. Every laugh line is a tale. Each wrinkle holds a secret. The woman who tries to deny the changes time has wrought is not trusting that her natural qualities will shine through. A very nice sentiment there, so ponder on that and see you guys next time. Oh, no.